We're talking today with Mike Burton of East Grand Rapids, Michigan. The interviewer is James Smither of Grand Valley State University. All right, Mr. Burton, why don't you start by telling us a little bit about your background. Where were you born? Where did you grow up? I was uh, born in Detroit and grew up in Trenton, Michigan. Um, Trenton is a suburb in Wayne County. And when I graduated from high school, I applied to and was accepted at Grand Valley State College at that time. Okay. Just before we get there, uh, what did your parents do? Uh, my father worked for Ford Motor, and my mother uh, stayed home. Okay. So what made you pick Grand Valley? It wasn't a very old school at that point. No, it was quite, it was quite new. Uh, I had an indistinguished uh, academic career in high school, and Grand Valley was uh, willing to give me a chance mm -hmm. based on potential. And, uh, and that, that worked out well, I think, for, the, for me, and certainly, and for the school. Uh, what was the place like when you got there? Smaller than my high school. Mm -hmm. uh, there, were, there, uh, there were, I think, two apartment buildings, Grand Valley Apartments. Mm -hmm. uh, there was um, an old barn that was a field house um, and a couple of academic buildings, mm -hmm. just a couple. Lake, uh, Lake Michigan Hall was there, maybe Lake Huron. Mm -hmm. I think I Seedman was there yeah. at that time. I think those were the first, the original first three buildings. Uh, so there was not really a library yet, or was that no. in one of the buildings, or no? That was just yeah, it was in one of the one of the buildings. Okay, what were you studying, or what? Uh, at that point, I, I wasn't uh, just getting my freshman courses in, and hadn't hadn't uh, uh, thought of any particular course of study. Because mm -hmm. Grand Valley is a place that had a few different incarnations early on. And, uh, now, what year was that when you were there? I started there uh, uh, 1965. Okay, so that's is that pioneer class or the pioneer one after? class? Uh, I think I was the. F I think there were juniors. There were no seniors mm -hmm. yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so pretty early on. So the school was still kind of following its original sort of classical liberal, liberal arts orientation and not something else yet. Exactly, where we're, we would have tutorials with our professors, mm -hmm. uh, small class sizes. It was uh, a wonderful environment. Mm -hmm. So, uh, how was it that you wound up uh, leaving Grand Valley and going into the military instead? My, uh, my father told me that he would pay for a year of college. Mm -hmm. And uh, toward the end of my, my first year, I wasn't sure how I would pay for the rest of my education. Um, I also had dropped a class in spring term and my draft board contacted me. Mm -hmm. I believe that that uh, if I told them that I'd taken a couple classes the summer before, I was actually ahead of my, my class, mm -hmm. uh, they wouldn't have attempted to draft me. Uh, but instead of doing that, I, I joined the Marine Corps, which had a two-year enlistment, uh, believing that I would be able to use the GI Bill to pay for my remaining three years of college. Why did you pick the Marine Corps rather than simply go into the Army? Uh, the Army had some uh, ready reserve obligation that the Marine Corps did not have mm -hmm. at the time, and the Marine Corps is offering a two-year enlistment. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think they've ever offered that since, but uh, at that time they did. All right. Uh, at what point did you actually uh, start training in the Marine Corps? Uh, July of 1966. Okay. And where did you go for that? San Diego. All right. Can you describe that experience for us? Uh, my initial reaction was that uh, that the sergeant that came to meet us at the airport uh, was having a, a mental breakdown. He was uh, screaming in, in a very crazy uh, fashion, um, vulgarities in the airport that were, would have been offensive to anyone. Uh, and I thought, well, as soon as we get to the base, you know, they'll get him some, uh, some psychiatric help. But that proved to be the way it was mm -hmm. for a couple of months. Um, a lot of screaming, uh, uh, intense uh, physical training, not much rest. Mm -hmm. uh, and how long did that go on? Uh, that went on for eight weeks, followed by two more sessions uh, after boot camp graduation of, of additional uh, training before before the Marines went to their first base. Okay. Uh, at what point did you start things like weapons training? We had rifle training in boot camp. Mm -hmm. And 
and then after boot camp, we learned uh, more. We had more rifle training and other other weapons training. Okay. So, having left boot camp, where did you where did you go next? Uh, after my my first deployment was to Hawaii, mm -hmm. which was uh, I was one of I think there were ten of us that went to Hawaii and seventy had orders for Vietnam. I was one of the ones that went to Hawaii. Mm -hmm. So in Hawaii, I was with a unit called 127, and we uh, we guarded uh, we guarded Hawaii, I guess. Uh, eventually, that group was disbanded, and we were all sent over as replacement troops. About how long were you in Hawaii? Probably uh, probably eight months or so. Okay, and so how did you spend your time there? What kinds of things were you doing? Uh, well, I. I would uh, never wanted to lose my attachment to civilian life. I called it uh, hiking and, and camping. Mm -hmm. But we had a lot of mock uh, mock war exercises, um, uh, some of which were conducted on boats where we went over the side in nuts, mm -hmm. uh, like in World War II movies. Mm -hmm. We landed on the island of Molokai and uh, um, carried our, our weapons and shelter halves and and food and hiked around a couple of days on the island of Molokai. And of course we uh, had the weekends to, to play, so Hawaii was great duty. I was at one point uh, on the tennis team. The, um, the base had a tennis team, they had six guys that were on that team. I played uh, a little bit in high school. I didn't play at Grand Valley that first year. Yeah, uh, but when I went off for the tennis team, I was able to be the, the, the last guy that made the mm -hmm. team. I was number six on the team. Um, and I actually turned in my rifle and was issued a tennis racket. Mm -hmm. And for a few weeks, uh, that was my job, was to play tennis in Hawaii against the junior college, the freshman team from the university, other military um, bases mm -hmm. had tennis teams, um, and I thought that seemed like a, a pretty good duty. Unfortunately, the coach of the team was a lieutenant, and one guy, one day a guy showed up who announced himself as a captain and said he wanted to be on the tennis team, mm -hmm. and they said, Burton, back to the infantry. So I turned my tennis racket in and, uh, and drew an M14 again. And how long after that was it that you shipped out to Vietnam? Not not long. Uh, shortly after that, uh, they disbanded 127 and sent us all over as replacement troops. If you had stayed on the tennis team, would you have stayed there? Would you have had to go with 127? I think I would have. I think if I'd been on the tennis team, I was out of 127, mm. so I think I would have stayed in Hawaii and played tennis the whole time. Okay. Uh, where did you go then from Hawaii? Uh, from, from Hawaii, we went... We went to, uh, we had some, some training in California, mm -hmm. and then went to Okinawa. What kind of training were they giving you in California that was different uh, from before? Well, we were trained on the M16, which mm -hmm. was the, the, mod, the, at that time, the modern rifle, mm -hmm. which was smaller, lighter um, than the M14. It's actually an assault rifle as mm -hmm. opposed to a battle rifle. And for a lay audience, what's the difference? Uh, battle rifle is a big, heavy rifle that's effective at longer ranges. Mm -hmm. The assault rifle is uh, is lighter, uh, usually smaller ammunition. You can carry more ammunition, mm -hmm. and probably not as accurate uh, uh, for a, a longer shot. Mm -hmm. So that was a lot of the training uh, prior to Vietnam was familiarization with the M16 and uh, lots of lots of running. Lots of running and sleep deprivation to get us used to the idea that you might not be getting as much sleep as you, you were used to. Were you being trained either there or earlier by people who had actually been in Vietnam and had combat experience there? Uh, we never really knew. We assume so. A and I assume so now, for the most part. So at that point, they weren't really telling you anything about what to expect in Vietnam? or. Oh, they all they all opined on that. Uh, everybody had ideas about uh, what it, what it would be like, and I suspect it was experiential for most of them. 
uh, and did it bear any resemblance to what you wound up experiencing? Yeah, they tried to let us uh, have a sense of the, of the chaos, mm -hmm. and, and that certainly held true. Um, the sleep deprivation that I mentioned mm -hmm. certainly held true, and uh, uh, going at a fast pace all day uh, was useful, just getting used to the, the, the distances traveled, mm -hmm. um, the carrying a pack you know, for, for hours right. at a time. Okay, so then, having completed that round of training, did you go directly to Vietnam or stop elsewhere along the way? That was in California, then we stopped at o in Okinawa, mm -hmm. which was uh, uh, designed to be a quick layover and then a flight over to Vietnam. And how long were you in Okinawa? Uh, my friend and I uh, were in Okinawa about a week. Uh, when we realized that the morning formation was to herd people onto planes for Vietnam, uh, we quit going to morning formation mm -hmm. and just, just kind of hid out. Uh, enjoyed being in Okinawa. Part of that related to the fact that I was a two-year guy mm -hmm. and uh, as a uh, as a two-year guy my time was was running down and uh, I, I wasn't concerned about having to spend a few months in the brig and then spend <laughs> 13 months in Vietnam. Uh, any day I wasn't getting shot at I thought was probably worthwhile. Okay. Uh, then from Okinawa, you, you go to Vietnam. Um, how did you go over there? How were they transporting you? We went on a commercial uh, airline. I think it was Pan American, if mm -hmm. I remember. Um, and uh, I was never on a, a military plane mm -hmm. uh, until coming back. Uh, that in itself was quite strange when we got to Vietnam mm -hmm. and we were let off the airplane the stewardesses put on flak jackets and, and the helmets, which um, reminded us all uh, this is a scary place. Okay, and did they take you to Saigon or somewhere else? I'm not sure where okay. it was. Uh, then once you landed, what happened to you? Uh, we were uh, funneled to different places that needed replacement troops. Um, I know I was in Dung Ha and Kan Tien, and uh, eventually made it out into the field. Okay. Um, how did you, what unit were you assigned to, and how did you wind up assigned to it? I, I uh, had been writing to a friend of mine who had been at Grand Valley when I was there, and he had gone directly to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And because I had been writing to this guy, I knew his address, which meant mm -hmm. I knew his unit number. Right. And I discovered that that as they would split us into groups, they would uh, as they would it, as as replacement troops, they would divide us into some to first marine division, mm -hmm. some to third. Mm -hmm. I made sure I was in line for the third marine division, and I kept doing that until I got to Golf Company, second battalion, ninth marines. Mm -hmm. It was all, just following his address, and I got uh, got into the same company that my friend Ron was in. Mm -hmm. And had you heard much, much at all from him since the two of you had parted ways? I mean, was he not too much? I sent, I sent information to him. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't get too much back from him. And what was the sort of situation that your unit was in at the time that you joined it then? Uh, well, it had picked up the nickname the Walking the Walking Dead. Uh, they'd been um, hit very hard a number of times. And what part of Vietnam were they in? This was 500 yards short of the DMZ. Okay. It was, and they'd been in the DMZ. They'd gone into the DMZ and been uh, almost wiped out. Now, uh, we're dealing with, with a war that's, in this particular case, 40 years old. And a lot of people, if they hear DMZ and, that, and they may know it means demilitarized zone, uh, that would, would sound like a, a, a place where you, you didn't have anybody shooting anybody. but. What actually was it and how did it work? Well, there shouldn't have been anyone in there. Mm -hmm. It was a large uh, band uh, separating North Vietnam and South Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And uh, we really shouldn't have gone in there. Mm -hmm. uh, and there shouldn't have been anywhere, anybody in there to, uh, to engage us. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, however, as it worked out, uh, the 2-9 did go in, and, and uh, this was before I was there, but I was mm -hmm. told of it. 2-9 did go in and, and uh, suffered uh, very heavy casualties. Did the North Vietnamese infiltrate across the uh, demilitarized zone? Uh, yes, constantly. Okay. We didn't see Viet Cong mm -hmm. where I was. We saw North Vietnamese Army, which were um, typically uniformed and moved in en masse and were uh, much more conventional, uh, as you think of an army, mm -hmm. as opposed to the, the guerrillas who were in the Viet Cong fighting in the South. Although I know there were large contingents of Viet Cong, um, I think typically that was, they were smaller units. Mm -hmm. okay. what, what was it like or what was your impression when you first joined your company? That was, uh, I, I was, I was frightened of course. And when my friend was, uh, when I got out to the field where, where my friend was, he, uh, he came back and described the um, described me as having having found my way to the one of the worst places possible <laughs> in, the, in the country of Vietnam. Uh, that the fighting had been heavy for a long time, and and it was a bad bad place to be. And uh, he thought I was uh, foolish for having having uh, gotten there. As it turned out, he was of quite an influential character, and. Uh, managed to offer, afford me some protection while I was there. What could a more experienced soldier do for a new recruit? Uh, I think the first day that uh, we were hiking in the field, um, the word came back for the new guy to walk point mm -hmm. um, in the, in the uh, front of the unit, uh, which is one of the more dangerous places to be. And before I uh, went up to the front, uh, some guy volunteered to walk point for me. Mm -hmm. I later learned that, that my, my pal had uh, forgiven a gambling debt. So we, can, we were walking in the middle of the pack, uh, mm -hmm. um, reminiscing about our, our, our first year at Grand Valley. And, uh, and this, this other guy was walking point for me. What was the terrain like in that area? It was, uh, it was hilly, it was, it was uh, generally green. Lush kind of reminded me of the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, green everywhere you looked. So was it forested or? It was, uh, it was, there were, there were a lot of trees, but uh, um, there were open, open meadows also. Mm -hmm. And was this in the It was really quite pretty. Mm -hmm. uh, was any of the local population still there or they all been moved someplace else? We didn't, yeah, we didn't see any. I didn't see any while I was there. Mm -hmm. Um, how large an area was it that you were operating in or patrolling in? Or how far might you walk or go in a day? Or yeah, I, uh, it's hard to, to estimate. You, you generally would walk all day. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but it was, it was a fairly slow-paced walking. Mm -hmm. And would you return to the same base regularly or would you move around a lot? Oh, while we were in the field, we were in different spots every night. Mm -hmm. Did you have any idea at the time what it was that you were supposed to be doing? Uh, well, my, my idea was not, not get killed and not get hurt mm -hmm. and uh, uh, you know, engage the enemy when they engaged us or, or if, we, if we found them. Mm -hmm. uh, but in terms of any sense of any sort of larger objective or what was your unit supposed to be accomplishing? Uh, well, I was a, a, a lowly enlisted man, mm -hmm. and those kinds of things weren't talked about. Right. Okay. Uh, describe just the physical conditions you know, that you were in, the day-to-day -day living of being in the unit, marching around in the field. What was that like? It was very hot during the day, and we were carrying, um, we were carrying packs, rifles, steel helmets, 14-pound flak jackets uh, that we would wear, sleeveless flak jackets. Mm -hmm. Um, cartridge belts, maybe seven fully loaded magazines. Uh, I think I carried typically eight, eight hand grenades. Uh, you often have either bandoliers of machine gun cartridges, linked cartridges for machine guns, or maybe a rocket, uh, a, a, a rocket for a 3.5 rocket mm -hmm. launcher.
or, or perhaps mortar shells. You usually have something right. additional beyond what you carry. About what do you think your total kit would have weighed? Maybe 35 pounds. Mm -hmm. Maybe okay. a little more than that, I don't know. All right. Uh, what did you do for food and water and stuff like that? Uh, we carried water. We could find water and use purification tablets. Uh, we carried our, our food in our packs, uh, and then food would get delivered in cases. The food was canned food mm -hmm. sea rations. Um, uh, they would have the year on those, and some of them were older than I was, <laughs> which is surprising. They'd all come with four cigarettes, uh, which was a benefit to me. Uh, as a, well, it was a great benefit for the smokers, but as a non-smoker, uh, those were wonderful trade items. I mean, I could always manage to uh, uh, trade my cigarettes in a, in a, a meal I didn't care for, mm -hmm. for, for something that I liked. Or, uh, or perhaps uh, somebody's cocoa powder uh, to make hot chocolate. So I, I love getting those cigarettes every day. Uh, let's see. You get four per meal, so you actually got 12 cigarettes a day. Uh, you said the, the canned food, at least, would get delivered to you. I mean, how does that happen if you're walking they, around they out They might the get dropped, dropped from a helicopter. Okay. Or, or a helicopter might land and, and drop them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, did you heat the food or? Yeah, we had uh, uh, tablets like an alka like a thick Alka-Seltzer uh, uh, tablet called a heat tab, and, mm -hmm. and you could light that and it would burn, and it would heat uh, heat eight one can of food reason reasonably well. Mm -hmm. You'd put three rocks uh, down and put the can on top of the three rocks. Uh, light, uh, open a can, light the heat tab, mm -hmm. and have fairly hot food. Were some varieties better than others? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. There, there was one called ham and lima beans that I detested. I don't think I ever, I think I ate that once, probably in California in boot camp training. Mm -hmm. yeah, I've never been a lima bean fan, so I'd always trade that away. Yeah. So, so was there a particular top of the line gourmet item in sea rations? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, just one that I would avoid. And some sounded better on some nights than others. Uh, they'd come with different things. They might come with crackers and peanut butter or cheese uh, or hot chocolate packets. So there, there was some variety and you could mm -hmm. trade around. If you, if you were a non-smoker and had those cigarettes, you could pretty much uh, have what you wanted in the, in the sea ration uh, uh, venue. Okay. Um, what kinds of things did people take along with them that were not regulation? You've got the stuff you're supposed to be carrying. What else uh, might one take with one out in the field? Oh, you know, everybody would have a picture of a girlfriend. Maybe uh, there would be uh, maybe some some Tabasco sauce to change your sea ration mm -hmm. to uh, instead of beans and franks, it can be spicy beans and franks. Um, and supplemental weapons were the thing that, that I noticed mm -hmm. that, that uh, amazed me. Um, the Marine Corps did not seem to care if people carried supplemental weapons, as long as you had the weapons you were required to, to carry. So I saw uh, guys with uh, six shooters and gun belts. Mm -hmm. I saw a guy who had a, a shoulder holster and a snub nose 38, which sounds like the stupidest <laughs> thing to have in the jungles of Vietnam. But uh, I, think, I think that uh, you could tell someone's taste in movies sometimes by what they carried. Uh, we had one fellow who was Native American, and he carried a, a tomahawk with him that had um, it had feathers hanging from mm -hmm. the handle. And of course, his name was Chief, of course. Mm -hmm. A lot of guys had nicknames. Of course, he was Chief. Some guys had shotguns sent from home. Did any of these weapons do anybody any good, or did you ever see any of them use any of them? I never thought they were any. They were anywhere nearly as effective as an M16. Mm -hmm. um, and I think uh, under stress, I think it, the M16s would come to the fore. Mm -hmm. The firepower of M16 is is pretty impressive in terms of uh, I think it's 750 rounds per minute firing rate. Mm -hmm. But how many does a magazine hold? Twenty. Yeah. So, so it doesn't take long yeah. to go through it. 750 sounds pretty good until you think about that part. Until you think about that part. Uh, you'd have a choice of uh, semi-automatic one bullet per, mm -hmm. per trigger pull. 
Um, so th that would slow down the rate of fire. Or you could move the selector to full automatic and, and, and shoot 20 rounds in um, mm -hmm. a second and a half or something. About how long were you uh, on this duty? Because you, you get hurt eventually and come out. So about how long were you in the field? It was, uh, I, I really don't know. I don't know the when I was inserted. It was uh, two or three weeks. Okay. It's a relatively short phase there. Uh, That's probably that maybe why some of this is so vivid. Mm -hmm. I never really had time to acclimate. To the extent that there was such a thing, what was a typical day on patrol like? Uh, boredom interrupted by uh, uh, by panic and chaos. How much did you ever see of the North Vietnamese? Uh, you'd see movement. Mm -hmm. You know, you'd, you'd see some movement in the in the distance. You didn't see them up close typically. So if you got into a fight of some kind or started shooting, what would happen? Uh, lead would be thrown back and forth, and and uh, and then you'd assess what what you had and and um, how much damage you'd inflicted on the enemy. Mm -hmm. Were you able to or have occasion to call in, you know, fire support or air support or artillery or anything like yeah. that? Yeah. Air support was was. Uh, Tremendous advantage that we had. Um, we used mortars a lot, mm -hmm. and so did they. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Our big mortars were 81 millimeter mortars, and the um, North Vietnamese used a mortar that was, uh, I believe, it was an 82 millimeter mm -hmm. mortar. So if they captured some of our 81 millimeter uh, mortar shells. Mm -hmm. They could throw them down their 82 millimeter right. tube, but their 82s were useless mm -hmm. uh, for us to use in our 81s. Uh, okay, so you didn't really spend very much time in, in Vietnam per se at all. That's so correct. you don't have a lot of the kinds of experiences that you know some of the other ones have of you know being off duty or anything else like that. Um, can you tell us sort of about the fight that your unit got into that eventually took you out of the battle as well as your friend and so forth? And how can you describe that? Uh, well, the day before I got hit, uh, we, we had, there was a, a mortar battle. Uh, and our group went from, I believe it was 54, to 15 of us were left after they mm -hmm. uh, evacuated the killed and wounded. One of the guys who was hurt was my friend Ron, mm -hmm. uh, who had, had been a roommate at Grand Valley. And uh, he had uh, shrapnel fragments uh, up and down the front of him. And he, he, he was um, pretty well shot up. Mm -hmm. um, and he, there, were, there was question in his mind and question in my mind whether he was going to survive. Mm -hmm. uh, he did, as it turns out. And uh, he went to the, the hospital ship, and then he ended up at the Great Lakes Naval Hospital, uh, north of Chicago, mm -hmm. uh, where Marines from Michigan would be sent if they were wounded for treatment. Okay. And then you got hurt the next day. The uh, uh, next day, uh, sometime around midnight, mm -hmm. we were attacked again. It was a mortar attack, and, and that's when when I was hit. I think my uh, I think I'd drawn the the shift from two a.m. to um, four a.m. Mm -hmm. and um, so I was to sleep from from 10 o'clock until 2 a.m. and then be awake for two hours and then go back to sleep for two hours mm -hmm. and then get up for the day. But uh, we didn't get there because, because we came under attack. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was sleeping when, when the attack started and I was hit very quickly into that attack. Very soon after it started, I was, I was hit by, uh, by mortar uh, fragments. Shrapnel mm -hmm. from mortars. Okay. And what condition were you in then at that point? Um, my, um, my left leg was kind of chewed up. 
I, um, yeah, uh, I was hit in the, in the buttocks and hit in the back. I had uh, two broken ribs and a sucking chest wound. My right lung was collapsed and, and um, when I would breathe, air would come mm -hmm. in and out uh, of the wound. Um, my leg was actually broken, mm -hmm. uh, although I, uh, I was able to get up and run on it. Ran to my my hole mm -hmm. to dive in to protect myself. There's somebody already in there. So you were sleeping then, just up on the ground. Up on the ground. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then when an attack would start, you 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 go to the hole that you mm -hmm. you dug uh, so that you could get below the ground level. And so this is sort of like you got hit in the first shot, essentially. I think so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My hair was on fire. I slapped my hair out, which was long. Uh, in Vietnam, I was able to have a beard and. And long hair. It was nothing like Hawaii. Yeah, uh, that's actually or longer hair. Also, also, I guess worth considering. I mean, you, you get in a lot of the, the there's the media and the movie versions of Vietnam and, and things like this. And there's a lot there. But what it's actually like to be in small units and what kind of discipline and stuff there is there. How was being in a unit like that up in the front lines different from being back in the rear area or in the states? Uh, the petty stuff was not emphasized. Mm -hmm. uh, Shoe shines or, or spit shines on your boots uh, was not important. It was uh, how you were able to perform in the field was really all that mattered. Uh, some of that was pragmatic. And some of that was that the uh, NCOs and the officers didn't want to be too petty. The mm -hmm. guys who were running around, you know, with automatic weapons and hand grenades, <laughs> uh, there was kind of an understanding that that. Uh, well, they, they understood that they would be relying on the troops, mm -hmm. and they didn't, you know, if they needed to be uh, assisted, uh, they would want loyal troops with them. Um, so there was more camaraderie between the enlisted men and the uh, high-ranking NCOs and the officers mm -hmm. than there had been anywhere uh, that I'd ever been before. Mm -hmm. Were the NCOs or the officers that you actually saw in your own unit, did they seem to be experienced people who knew what they were doing, or were some of them as new as you were? Uh, but they were, I, most of them were more experienced, I think. But, but you could have been there for six months and be more experienced mm -hmm. than I was. Yeah. How long was anyone likely to actually be out there? 13, 13 months was a tour of duty. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, uh, people would rotate back. Right. Uh, to the to the rear area, um, but 13 months was a tour in Vietnam for the Marine Corps, 12 months for the Army. Okay, uh, when you got hit, you're hit pretty bad. What kind of care did you get at that point? Or uh, corpsman, which is a term uh, the Navy uses for for um, the the guys that do the job that we think of as medics mm -hmm. in the Army. Uh, corpsman came out. Uh, assessed my injuries pretty quickly, uh, immediately reassured me, um, described my wounds as a million dollar wound that would send me back to mm -hmm. the States. Um, he, um, he quickly uh, put an airtight bandage over my, um, the wound that was creating the sucking mm -hmm. chest wound and then he flipped me on top of that side which was quite painful, but it was the right thing to do because then I wasn't bleeding into my good lung. Right. Uh, from there I went on a, a helicopter to a battalion aid station, which was a tent mm -hmm. hospital, um, kind of what we think of as a mash unit, yeah. and then from there to the hospital ship. I stayed on the hospital ship for a few weeks, I guess, mm -hmm. and from the hospital ship uh, was shuttled by a hospital plane uh, back eventually to Great Lakes, Illinois, where I stayed for uh, uh, several months until my enlistment was up. Um, what was that, at that point, at least once you're out of anesthesia and things like that, um, what did you think about what was going on? Were you just were you glad to be out of there or just thinking about physical problems? or I was very glad to be out of there. Uh, they could not reassure me that I would keep my left leg, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, at that point I thought that would be a small price to pay. If I lost my left leg below the knee, mm -hmm. um, 
and didn't have to go back, uh, I probably would have counted myself lucky. Uh, I also at that time had a temporary colostomy, so my uh, feces were coming out of my side. Uh, and I had high hopes that that would be reversed mm -hmm. successfully, and it was. Um, the, the dangerous situation was the, the uh, chest wound mm -hmm. and an infection, uh, but those things resolved too. So I think, I, I feel like I had excellent uh, medical care. Mm -hmm. uh, in the field, at the temporary field hospital, mm -hmm. on the hospital ship, on the, uh, the long, long flight back and right. the hospitals that we would stop at on the way and then at Great Lakes. Mm -hmm. and about, what was the uh, Great Lakes experience like? I mean, what, what were you doing while you were there? Because you were there a long time. I was there a long time. We had, uh, we had a, a, a room where there were 80 of us. Um, there, were, there was a kind of a, a low central wall dividing the, the ward. Mm -hmm. And there were uh, 20, 20 beds against the wall, 20 beds against the center wall, mm -hmm. and the same on the other side. So there were really four rows, four rows of 20 each. Uh, and we, uh, we had one TV set that was probably a, a large TV for the time, maybe a 20 inch mm -hmm. TV set or something. And, uh, I remember uh, watching Jeopardy with Art Fleming and <laughs> screaming out answers. Uh, nurses would come around, uh, the corpsmen would come around. We kind of picked on the corpsmen uh, who, were, who were rookie, rookie guys mm -hmm. and they deferred to us because we, we'd been in the military a little longer mm -hmm. and had been in combat. Most of those guys may have ended up in Vietnam Mm -hmm. uh, like the corpsman who helped me out in the field. So some of these guys that joined the Navy and, and ended up essentially field Marines. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't probably their expectation when they, when they joined. Yeah. Uh, did you see people you knew when you were in the hospital? I saw a couple of people. Uh, my, my Grand Valley buddies, uh, Ron and Lou, were, were at Great Lakes Naval with me. Those were, those were great reunions. Uh, uh, we, all, we all recovered pretty well, mm -hmm. I think. And at the point when you're discharged from the hospital, were you then discharged from the military as well, or did you have still have to stay in a while longer? It, uh, at the time they were ready to discharge me from the hospital, my enlistment was up, so mm -hmm. they just, uh, they just uh, sent me home as having completed my enlistment. I probably stuck around a couple of weeks in something called casual company, where I really wasn't able to return to full duties, mm -hmm. but I could, uh, I could wrap bandages. Mm -hmm. I, I remember painting a room one time, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Easy, easy stuff. And what did you do then when you got out? I um, tried to keep myself busy for the summer, and then in the fall I was back at Grand Valley. I went straight through and um, got my degree on the GI Bill. And what did you get a degree in in the end? I got a Bachelor of Science in Sociology mm -hmm. uh, with uh, an English minor and ended up uh, eventually working for the state of Michigan as a um, caseworker at the Welfare Department, mm -hmm. uh, a social worker. Uh, at that time, I might point out, at that time there was no, no degree in social work that he obtained. Yeah. Do you think that your experiences in, in the military and the stuff that you had to go through, did that help you at all uh, on the other end, if you were a social worker, that shaped the way you looked at things? I, w I was less, less fearful. Really, never been as intensely uh, afraid as I was in Vietnam, and occasionally I've been in some situations. I was I did some protective services work, mm -hmm. and for a while I worked for the Department of Corrections. And sometimes I was into some situations that were uh, 
they were perhaps a, a little bit scary, but mm -hmm. uh, they didn't seem to bother me as much as they did some of my, my colleagues. Um, you know, the kind of, the kind of skills that, that you learn in the service aren't typically very adaptive. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the goals of the, 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 the excellent counseling that I've, I've gotten through the VA has been to unlearn some of the stuff that was learned in the military. Mm -hmm. Things that are adaptive are there. That's going to ring a few more times probably. Well, we can yeah, let it can just cut it out. My wife is upstairs taking a snooze. She may, she may pick it up or she may not. But voicemail will catch it here. Mm -hmm. Four ring variety. Yeah, uh, we don't always. Uh, Mary Ellen doesn't always get to the phone quickly enough. Although most people won't let it ring that many times. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. I mean, you're talk talking about what you're learning and unlearning and so forth in the military. I mean, what is the, what is what are the Marines teaching you that? With some of the adaptive skills were were uh, the ability to get intensely angry very quickly, and, and that is uh, uh, can be a good skill to have in combat, and, a, and a, just a, a terrible terrible uh, thing to have in an office situation. I can see that. Uh, uh, not trusting people mm -hmm. uh, can can be somewhat adaptive or to, to set limits on, on uh, how far you'll go uh, trusting someone. Not forming real close attachments can be adaptive. One of the things that um, often gets stressed about at least some military experiences in some places, some World War II and so forth, is the idea that you, know, you do trust your buddies or whatever. The guys that you're serving with uh, were there limits to that, or were you kind of conditioned? I think it was. I think it's very different in Vietnam, because you weren't in for the duration. You were mm -hmm. in for your your hitch. If it was 13 months, uh, you knew when you got there that um, that you were to rotate back in in 13 months. Everybody knew their mm -hmm. their day that they were going back uh, to what was called the world, meaning mm -hmm. anywhere other than Vietnam. And so you were doing your own time. You weren't really there as a unit. And I, I think that was a big difference um, from what we experienced and what the World War II vets that I've, I've talked to over the years have experienced. Yeah. Chris, you All were my also, uncles, yeah. my dad. Mm -hmm. um, of course, you were also a replacement. And even in World War II, if you're a replacement, it's, it's sort of a different game because you could go anywhere and a lot of the veterans would kind of be standoffish, at least in the combat units because they weren't sure how long you were going to be around, too. Exactly. So it may parallel some of that a, a little bit better. Um, in kind of coming out of all of this, and as you kind of learn more about things and you're back in college and so forth, uh, what kind of view did you have of the war itself? I, uh, I came to oppose it. Mm -hmm. I uh, opposed the war in Vietnam and was... Uh, I was outspoken about it. Uh, I had a letter published in Time Magazine supporting mm -hmm. President Carter's decision to provide amnesty to people that mm -hmm. uh, uh, went to Canada mm -hmm. uh, to avoid the war, uh, which was probably unusual for a veteran, uh, an unusual position. Uh, I th think, of course, what got me talking to you was watching uh, The War, the mm -hmm. Kenneth Burns uh, documentary that I found so powerful. And Burns talked about that war being a necessary war. Mm -hmm. uh, he said in the initial episode, there's no good war, mm -hmm. uh, but there may be necessary wars, and that World War II was probably a necessary war. And I, and I thought that, that that resonated for me quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And I agree that World War II probably was a necessary war. I don't think Vietnam was a necessary war. I certainly don't think that Iraq is a necessary mm -hmm. war. 
And as we look at Iraq now, the, the, the echoes of Vietnam are there. There's a small cottage industry in producing books with Iraq and Vietnam in the title, uh, and, and a lot of different stuff being spun off of it, having been through one and watched another one. Um, do you see particular parallels or things just going to stand out from your point of view? Uh, the, the reason for entry into the conflict was questionable in Vietnam, mm -hmm. certainly questionable in Iraq. Um, the big debate now uh, seems to be uh, whether, whether the faulty intelligence was believed or not. Mm -hmm. Uh, nobody thinks that the reasons stated for going in were correct, and the administration seems to try to defend its decision by saying, uh, we didn't know what was going on, mm -hmm. which would seem to suggest incompetence, um, which is preferable to, to cynically going in when they did know what was wrong. Yeah. We, maybe historians will uncover more and more about this as time goes on. Another sort of legacy of, of Vietnam that comes out of this that, that, that seems to be reflected today a little bit is the, the whole idea of you know, supporting our troops. And the idea is that sort of the guys coming out of Vietnam were, were treated badly or not supported. I mean, what kind of experience did you have returning to civilian life having uh, been a Marine and, and been in Vietnam and do you think it's affected by not being there very long? Well, I, I recall uh, being in California wearing wearing the uniform, being called the baby killer, mm -hmm. uh, and not face to face directly, but from a distance, but in a you know in a loud, clear voice, and and that was was that before you'd gone anywhere yet? Uh, yes, yeah. and you know I I, I would have liked the opportunity to have challenged that. Mm -hmm. I never uh, had a chance. Uh, when uh, William Kelly uh, was convicted of the, the My Lai massacre, mm -hmm. you know, I f felt like I wanted to tell people that wasn't what I did. Mm -hmm. That wasn't part of you know, my experience. Mm -hmm. And did but, but people, you know, how, how do you how do, you, how do you convince people of that? I mean, did, were there people who seemed to sort of judge you or lump you together with that, or could you pick up on that, or just? I think so. Nobody had saw us any weed at Grand Valley when we first came back until our hair grew out. Uh, you know, if if they uh, worked for the, you know, if they were in the service, maybe they're, you know, they probably got recruited to be narcs on campus now. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I can remember that, which resulted in, 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 the, uh, in uh, uh, some misadventures among some of the returning vets. Um, the guy who was wounded, who was my friend in Vietnam, uh, ended, ended up uh, um, getting involved in the uh, marijuana uh, business just mm -hmm. because he had trouble uh, finding Finding anybody that would sell to him, he ended up selling it himself to his to his later detriment. Uh, it took a while. It took a while for people to get used to the idea. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we were we were veterans in 1968. Uh, Grand Valley had a a veterans club, and I can remember attending a meeting, mm -hmm. and someone thought that the veterans club should be. Um, working on the goal of getting the hippies off campus. <laughs> that was the last veterans meeting I went to. Was that being suggested by some of the veterans who were there? Or some of them, yeah. yeah. Uh, and and uh, I, I was just sort of bizarre. Today they're making some noises about the prospect of bringing back a draft or something else like that. Um, do you see positives or negatives in that as an idea, given that you had to deal with a draft and not too many years afterward, people didn't? 
I mean, I had to register for a draft, but there never was one. Uh, and, and you know, 30 years since, there hasn't been really, hasn't been enough either. Uh, what do you think of that as an idea? They, I remember when they had the, the uh, lottery for the draft, mm -hmm. and my birthday, April 10th, came up, I think it was 330. Mm -hmm. So if I had lasted that long, I certainly wouldn't, wouldn't have been drafted. It was you know, one of those funny coincidences. Funny coincidences, excuse me. Uh, I know that uh, Charles Rangel, the congressman out of New York, has said if, if, if we had a draft, this country wouldn't stand for this insane war in Iran. Mm -hmm. People wouldn't wouldn't allow this war to go on if it was their 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 sons and their their nephews uh, who were going to fight it. Mm -hmm. You know, rather than a, a, a select um, group composed perhaps of uh, of people that are impoverished to the point where it's a, you know one of the few chances that they have. Mm -hmm. um, and I think Rangel makes sense when he says that, that there'd be more civilian review and oversight of the war if it affected the country more mm -hmm. than it does. Or affected in ways that you notice as opposed to where the tax dollars are going or something. Exactly. Like that. Yeah. Exactly. And I think that does make sense. I think there would be no war in Iraq. Um, you know, I don't really like the idea of a draft, but... Mm -hmm. to, uh, I don't like the way things are going now either. Um, would you have anything to say to somebody who's just joined the Marine Corps and is heading off to Iraq or Afghanistan or wherever they're going? Uh, any encouragement, suggestion, advice, warning? Uh, when I left uh, for Vietnam, my dad said, keep your head and ass down. Mm -hmm. And later he said, you only listen to half of what I say. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, you know, at that point, I, I, I'd rather be talking to the guy before he goes to the recruiter. Mm -hmm. uh, because if he's already on his way, you know, I don't, I don't think there's much, much to say. You know, just uh, I tell him he's going to live with the memories for 40 years. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and conduct yourself in an honorable way, uh, no matter what your peers are doing, because mm -hmm. you're going to live with the memories of what you did. Uh, and a lot of a lot of uh, veterans have issues with with shame and or, or remorse for things that they did in this mm -hmm. very non ordinary uh, time and mm -hmm. these these events. And I would I would caution guys not to get get caught up in what a group is doing or mm -hmm. to, be, to be part of that. I think of what happened at Abu Ghraib, mm -hmm. which is which is not the same as massacre, yeah. but it's an example of I think of of some people getting into sort of a, a mob mentality mm -hmm. rather than really making their their own decisions about what's right. And I, I would also uh, talk about when you come back, make sure you check in with somebody, mm -hmm. a VA counselor or a private therapist or something, and, uh, and do that. And if, if you're fine, it'll be apparent that you are. Mm -hmm. And if you need to work on some stuff, that'll come out too. All right. Well, thank you very much uh, for your time. You're welcome.